I want to talk basically about how we can use some ideas from philosophy to help us to communicate better at uh, and do better at challenging or responding to misinformation um, and promote critical thinking. So um, hopefully there'll be some things here uh, that are a bit uh, a bit different or a bit interesting. So let me start with um, a general question. So why do people believe nonsense? Um, I'm not going to define what nonsense counts as here. You can, I'm sure everyone has uh, their own examples of uh, various nonsense that uh, <clears throat> is widely believed by people in the community. So let me just highlight a few sort of things that are important. Um, so lack of knowledge in education is definitely one. People just sort of don't know things or they have learnt something that they thought was true and they've just sort of held on that, held, held on to that for many years. But it's definitely not the only reason. And this is sort of a point that I, I'm going to come back to throughout the presentation today is that we can't think of uh, belief in misinformation or um, myths and things as just resulting from a lack of knowledge or a lack of education or a lack of information. There's more going on than just that. So some of the other things that are going on include the desire or the need to fit in with an identity group or a community. So this can be a religious community, a political community, uh, social groups, um, interest groups, um, online or in person. There's many ways that this can manifest. To provide emotional comfort or an outlet, so whether that's people worried about the future or dealing with a problem in life or feeling angry about something and feeling a, an emotional need to kind of resolve that, um, that can be a motivator for why people adopt certain beliefs. To fit into or cohere with other beliefs that they have, this is something I'll talk more about later. There's also personality or demographic characteristics that affect what people believe. Um, I mean, it's well known that beliefs sort of systematically vary with things like age. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and or like uh, level of education, income, rural versus urban status, many things like that. Uh, and that obviously fits in with things like identity group and community and so forth. So these sort of interact and overlap with each other. Now, I've just um, on the screen here put up a few uh, studies that have looked specifically at um, fake news, misinformation, um, misconceptions, things like that. These are more empirical based studies. So I just wanted to Put these up here sort of for your reference if anyone's interested in having a look at these. They're all quite interesting. I'm not going to talk about them in any particular detail today. Um, the focus of this talk is more conceptual, um, but it is sort of informed by um, some background of like empirical psychological research. And, and I think that there's evidence for all of the things that I've talked about as motivating um, belief in misconceptions or people holding on to misconceptions. Um, so I'm sort of leaving that as sort of backdrop if people are interested in looking at that empirical side. Um, but what I'm going to be focusing on is a bit more kind of conceptual or the philosophical aspects. Um, but I do think that they kind of, um, there's a synergy there. Um, and there is empirical research relating to the things that I'll be talking about as well. Okay, so what specifically am I going to be focusing on? So we know that there's lots of reasons why people believe uh, uh, crazy things. Um, and I've suggested that we can't think of it just as a lack of information or uh, a lack of education. So I want to suggest that at the root of the problem are sort of two fundamental issues. Um, people don't know how to think critically, and a subset of that maybe is don't know or don't care to practice critical thinking. And also, people have a poor epistemology. And by that, I mean epistemology is the study of knowledge, so that's a philosophical discipline. But by having a poor epistemology, I mean something like people don't know how what makes a belief justified or what good evidence looks like or how to evaluate claims. So it's relating to the first one, but there's, they're sort of slightly different. Um, having a poor epistemology might relate to your worldview. So for example, someone who believes in kind of every conspiracy theory that comes along uh, and thinks very conspiratorially might have a poor epistemology. Even if they think of themselves as a critical thinker, they might be kind of selective in the way that they deploy that. So that could be an example. Or there are people who are sort of very well educated and eloquent, but have... Um, you know, believe are a range of sort of very traditional religious beliefs, which I would suggest um, often rely on a sort of a poor epistemology. So these are related, critical thinking and epistemology, but they are a little bit distinct from each other. Um, and today what I want to focus on is sort of how can we, how can we improve these? How can we help people to think uh, critically to do that better? And how can we help people to sort of improve their epistemology, so to speak? I'll sort of explain what I mean by that. Um, and I want to emphasize that a lot of the, um, if you look at the empirical research on these sorts of topics, such as um, some of these studies that I mentioned, there, there is a fair bit of research that looks at kind of interventions. Um, so this might, uh, to, to combat misinformation. So this might be things like um, uh, 
a, a website that you recommend people to or a fact checker or uh, certain types of things that you could add to social media or things like that. Um, these are like interventions that you can kind of deploy. I'm not really going to focus on that. Again, this is not really an empirical discussion of interventions that we can use. It's more like um, how can we use I some ideas from philosophy to deploy in our own conversations and interactions with people um, to help them improve critical thinking and to help them sort of develop a better, as I say, epistemology. Um, the idea being that it, th these are the things that are that lie at the root of a lot of misinformation. Um, and so there's two specific ideas that I want to discuss today. So the first is, is um, I call appeals to authority. And so there's this big question about, you know, trust in science. Obviously, this is relevant for many things. Probably two of the most salient ones recently would be um, health information regarding, you know, vaccination, as well as um, information about climate change and likely impacts. But of course, there are many others as well. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot of appeals to trust science, trust the scientific consensus. And this is, you know, this is good. I think we should make those appeals. But I think there's a deeper level to it than that. You know, this relates more to the epistemology behind it, the philosophy behind it. Why should we trust science? Is that not an appeal to authority? When is it okay to appeal to authority? When is it inapplicable? Because, you know, atheists will often want to critique appeals to the Bible or religious tradition, um, but we would generally be in favor of appeals to science. I mean, science Scientists aren't always right, of course, but in general, we would say, well, if uh, scientists are in broad agreement about something, that's a, probably a good reason to believe it. So what's the difference there? Why are some authorities appropriate and some not appropriate? Um, and so that's the first thing that I'll be talking about and essentially how we can justify and motivate um, trust in science and appeals to sci scientific authorities. Um, the second question is about... Hey, sorry, I'm late. Uh, is it, it was about explanatory coherence. <laughs> we got someone drawing on this. Um, we want to provide a framework for people evaluating what the best explanation is. And often people accept explanations on the basis of fairly flimsy criteria. So, um, or yeah, well, we'll talk more about that, but that's the sort of second issue. So appeals to authority and trust in science and explains your coherence and um, how to evaluate explanations. So these are the two things that I want to discuss today. Oh yeah, I just put um, an example here about trust in science becoming more partisan. Um, in many countries, you can see that the, there's still relatively high levels of overall trust in, in science, but um, the difference between the political right and left is um, has been widening, I think, in recent years, especially in Eng English speaking countries. So this is an issue about like epistemic trust. Why do people trust in science and when don't they? Um, and why is that? All right. So let's make a start then with the first issue about science and appeals to authority. So. We all lack the time and knowledge to assess most scientific claims by ourselves. That should be sort of fairly self-evident. There's so much science uh, to know that we can't all be experts enough to assess those claims and all the evidence, which means that we need to trust in the expertise of scientists. I mean, this doesn't just apply to science. It applies to many things in life, but here particularly we're focusing on science. But the question is, why should we trust in scientists? Um, and what is the justification for that? What makes science more trustworthy than other sources of or potential sources of knowledge that people often rely on, such as anecdotes, religious texts, mystical experiences, or political debates, or political ideologues, uh, or just sort of introspection, you know, thinking uh, yourself. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's quite a lot of these sort of um, uh, appeals to trust in the science um, that you see um, in the discourse these days, particularly relating to like code information and climate change, but in other contexts as well. And what I want to emphasize here is that um, if we ask the question, why should we trust in science? I think that there are some, essentially there are some better answers and there are some worse answers that we can give to people. And I think this is important because if you're encountering someone who has a relatively low trust in science or has um, some issues with that, simply telling them to trust in science is, is probably not gonna be effective. You, you wanna to try to address the underlying concerns and provide them with reasons that might be compelling to them, right? And um, so there are some things that I think are less helpful. Um, so one thing that's often discussed, or one idea that's often discussed is the notion of the scientific method. So sometimes people will say, well, scientists follow the scientific method and that's how, you know, they can arrive at, at truth. Um, now I say here that there's not really any such thing as the scientific method. That's maybe a little bit strong because there are methods that scientists follow, but I think calling it, um, the scientific method is a bit, 
um, oversimplified, quite a lot oversimplified actually. Um, and furthermore, regardless of what method or methods scientists might follow, we would still need some kind of argument or justification about why that method itself was appropriate or justified. Um, and so it's perfectly reasonable to talk about, you know, the methods of science, and that's an active area in philosophy of science. But I do think that if we simply sort of tell people, oh, scientists follow the scientific method, uh, and, and therefore we can trust them, that's really a very big oversimplification, and it's not really particularly accurate or helpful. Um, we want, we would ideally want to say a little bit more about um, what those methods and, and that meth what those methods look like, and why they're justified. And we'll come back to that in a moment. That's not to say that you know nothing can be said. It's just that just calling it the scientific method, I think, is not so helpful. Another thing that I think we should avoid saying, and I think this is maybe more implied than directly stated, but sometimes it seems to be an attitude that people have, is is focusing on individual scientists. Um, and this this definitely happens sometimes, um, particularly with like celebrity scientists. Maybe I won't name individual names, but <laughs> people can think of their own examples. Um, not that there's anything wrong with science popularizers, things like that, but we have to be careful about elevating any particular individual uh, to too high a status or regarding what they have to say as particularly privileged uh, just because they're a scientist. Scientists are often just as stubborn and biased as, as pretty much other people are. Um, and we should really be focusing on fields of expertise and bodies of evidence rather than individual scientists. And so I don't think we want to be putting scientists on a pedestal as if they're sort of more epistemically virtuous than other people. Um, and I think that the, the right focus would be on science as a field and as a process rather than on particular scientists. So that's something that I think we should also avoid. Um, finally, there's a claim that's often made um, which is something to the effect that science is based on obs observable facts and evidence rather than speculations and dogma. And that's why we can trust it. Now, there's definitely an element of truth to this, um, but I do think it is a little bit simplistic. And it's, I think, dangerous to present this as a, such a simplistic contrast when you're trying to convince people of the importance of following the science. Because most people don't like to think of themselves as um, someone who's swayed by, you know, speculations or dogma or superstition or, or something like that. Um, most people like to think of themselves, at least to a degree, as basing their beliefs on evidence and logic, at least in some form, right, in some way. Um, and... Even in the case of science, there's more complexity to it. Observations aren't self-interpreting. We often need to interpret them in the light of a particular theory. Um, and, you know, theologians, mystics, and paranormal investigators, they all have their own facts that they interpret in the light of their own theories, right? And they claim to be, uh, many of them at least, basing their beliefs on observable facts and evidence, right? And so I think that, and so many people who are skeptical to, of science or a bit hostile of it in some ways, um, will often think of themselves as basing their beliefs on evidence and observable facts and things like that. So I think we need to go a little bit beyond just that sort of simplistic rhetoric of, you know, science is based on facts, whereas other things aren't. Um, in order to sort of articulate to people why it is that they should trust in science. Um, yeah, I've... I'm keeping an eye on the comments here. There's some good thoughts here. We can discuss some of these issues when we get to that section. So um, feel free to keep putting those ideas in. Um, so here I want to suggest to some better answers as to why, to encourage people why we should trust in science uh, and to promote um, sort of scientific thinking. So one thing that I think is incredibly important is that science is a relatively open intellectual endeavor. So unlike many religious institutions or um, even like political bodies or things like that, you don't need to sign a statement of faith or belief um, or join a religious order or something like that, like become a monk in order to publish science. I mean, you'll generally need certain qualifications, but it's not closed in the same way as many types of um, more sort of traditional um, religious or like political bodies are. Um, and I think that's very important. There's an openness that whereby people can gain access um, to scientific publishing and communicating their ideas, even if they're kind of outside of existing orthodoxy. It can still be difficult. There are still institutions, you know, that can um, make it difficult for newcomers. But I think science is a lot more open than many other fields of inquiry. Another thing that science does that's extremely important is that it presents evidence of public, it makes evidence and the results publicly available for evaluation and comment. Um, there's been recent moves to make more scientific data available, as well as the actual publications themselves more um, widely accessible uh, with open access. And I think that those are really important moves. Um, but I think that the fact that science is, um, th that a core component of science is to present um, evidence and findings 
in a public place, public make them publicly available and accessible for comment in a way that's often not done in quite the same way uh, in other fields or traditionally was done as much. So I think that that's critically important. It's the openness of science that helps self-correction. Um, so another thing that I think is important for science is that science takes a critical viewpoint and requires evidence to sort of convince people. Again, individual scientists can be too credulous or can make mistakes, but science as a whole does, does have a strong... It does place a strong value on collection and evaluation of evidence, and that just isn't true of many other many other fields. Um, in many other areas, take what I call here a credulous viewpoint, where the sort of the assumption is to just sort of believe claims, or that there's not a strong focus on on disbelief. And that's my experience in a lot of religious discourse. Um, of course, it depends on the exact claim, but there isn't that same culture of of disbelief and and skepticism that does exist or certainly should exist in science when it's being done well. Um, and that I think is very important. Um, and in science, nothing is sacred or beyond reproach or doubt that you can question everything. Again, if you question things that are very well established, you'll have your work cut out for you. But in principle, everything can be questioned. Um, nothing is regarded as like the sacred text that you can't, you know, just must be taken as gospel. Um, that just doesn't really exist in science. And science has, and, and the last point here is that science has self-correcting mechanisms that I think um, certainly are not perfect, but are quite a lot better than working uh, than those operative in sort of other disciplines or, or fields. Um, so, for example, findings that cannot be replicated often become suspect. Um, this may take many years. It's certainly not a perfect process. There are false findings that have been um, uh, published or maintained in journals for a long time, but almost always when these are uncovered and they're uncovered by other scientists um, who are attempting to replicate or investigate that research and the ability then to um, access you know journals and conferences and things like that to then um, uh, showcase the correction of those findings and the fact that there is nothing that's sort of sacred allows that self-correction to occur and similarly research programs that don't sort of yield results that don't produce valuable um, uh, understanding or increase of our knowledge, usually eventually they get abandoned. As new scientists will sort of um, try other approaches or funding will, will move in other directions, even if individual scientists might stubbornly um, uh, stick to the old ways as you know humans tend to do. But th over a long period of time, there tends to be a redirection of energy and resources towards um, research programs that are, that are yielding more fruit. So these sorts of mechanisms, the openness of science, the critical viewpoint, and the, the self-correcting mechanisms like replication and things like that are reasons why I think we can, broadly speaking, trust the scientific enterprise. And they, they are relatively distinctive of science. Um, not, again, to say that other di disciplines don't have any of these things or that these always work perfectly in science, because they certainly don't. Um, but I think that there's some things that are distinctive of and important um, for science. So that leads us then to think about, well, when is it appropriate to appeal to authority? We've, we've talked about some of the ways that, uh, some of the reasons why we can trust science and how does this relate to appeals to authority specifically? Um, and how can we explain that to people? Um, so there are, there's been a fair bit of discussion about this in, in philosophy about when it's okay to appeal to authority and when it isn't. Um, and there's broadly speaking, um, relative uh, level of agreement about what some of these criteria are when you can make a, a valid appeal to authority. So the first is that if you're appealing to a specific person, um, this person should be a genuine, should have genuine expertise in a particular field. Um, secondly, the claim that's being made or the claim that's being addressed or investigated um, must be related to that field. So very commonly um, people will appeal to an expert, but then the claim will be in a different field to where that expert has their expertise. And so obviously that's not gonna be appropriate uh, as an appeal to authority. So the claim has to, uh, you have to appeal to an authority regarding a claim in which they are an authority. Um, the third point here is that the field of study must utilize what I call appropriate epistemic standards. So that's kind of vague, but basically I'm talking about these sorts of um, mechanisms here. You know, things like the fact that science is relatively open, takes a critical viewpoint, has self-correcting mechanisms. Um, if uh, if you appeal to uh, a field like theology, which I would argue does not have those same mechanisms um, of, of self-correction and um, empirical focus and um, uh, a critical mindset and so forth, then um, I would be much less, uh, I'd be much more reluctant to accept that appeal uh, to that authority because I don't really trust that field. And then there's other fields like, you know, parapsychology or um, um, 
uh, cryptozoology and things like that, which in general, we would be skeptical about whether those fields follow um, you know, high epistemic standards, whether they use good evidential reasons. So you could be an expert in that field, uh, but if the field itself has relatively poor practices, then that appeal to authority will be suspect. And the final point here is that the preponderance of ev uh, sorry the preponderance of experts in that field must not disagree with the person you're appealing to. So if I find one climate scientist who is skeptical about you know global warming, that is not going to be a valid appeal to authority, given that like you know 99% of scientists disagree with them. So you can still listen to what that one expert says, right? It may be insightful, it might not be, but it's not going to be appropriate as an appeal to authority with respect to a claim where most experts disagree with them. So you, it's important here to look at the status of the expert in the field, the status of the field itself, as well as what other experts in that field have to say. All of these things are relevant in assessing an appeal to authority. So the idea is a good appeal to scientific authority would quote, say, a scientific body or expert who has expertise in a field that's relevant to the question at issue um, and where that field of study is, you know, a well-established and regarded um, scientific field. Um, parapsychology is an interesting case because there are people who've tried to pursue that sort of scientifically, but it's still kind of a bit fringe and has sort of suspect methods and of course there are other fields in academia where people might say that as well like social psychology has had a replication crisis recently so you know you could argue about that i suppose uh, and then the, the last point there is you want to make sure that the expert you're appealing to is not a fringe small minority in that field that they're actually um, saying something that is broadly supported um, by other experts in that field so these are all of the factors that need to be considered and i think that it's useful to try to sort of articulate these um in some capacities when we're trying to promote um, appeals to science um, or appeals to scientific authority so that we can sort of articulate when and why those appeals to authority are valid. Um, because the issue is what we don't want to be in a position of doing is saying that is saying to someone, well, you have your authorities that you like, whether that's religious or political pundits or whoever, um, you shouldn't listen to those. You should listen to our authorities instead. That's unlikely to be very convincing because, you know, there are reasons why they listen to theirs. And if we just say, but ours are better, you know, using that all sort of similar language, um, that, that's unlikely to be convincing to people. Um, so instead, what we might want to try to do is get people to think about, well, when is it appropriate to appeal to an authority? And how can we think about what those criteria might be? And then sort of try to illustrate why science has um, certain properties uh, of its processes and procedures, which make it worthy of trusting, at least in general. Um, so that's sort of the um, the general idea I wanted to get across here. Now, let me give an example of this to try to um, illustrate what I'm getting at. And obviously how you deploy this is going to depend on the context and who you're speaking to, right? But just to, to give a general idea. So when we're, imagine we're talking to a climate denier, right? Um, so here's some things that we could do instead of just telling them, or trust the consensus, you know, most scientists agree with this, so forth. Again, that's probably not going to be super convincing because of all of the factors in terms of why they trust their own experts, the, the identity behind it, the emotional factors, their own worldview, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, just appealing to scientific consensus or mentioning the names of scientists is unlikely to be very convincing. So there are some things we can do to help try to improve that. I mean, it's still going to be an uphill battle, but here are some here are some ideas in this context. So one thing that can be done, and I'm, there is empirical evidence to support this, is focusing on the broad range of agreement of researchers across the world. I think that this is potentially more important than saying like 97% or whatever it is. Um, focusing on the broadness of agreement of people across the world. So the IPCC, for example, is a UN um, agency or under the re uh, remit of a UN agency. And essentially every single country in the world has like signed up to or um, agreed with broadly the, the um, reports that they've produced. And it's actually pretty hard to think of an, any other examples where like every country agrees with anything. <laughs> so it's pretty remarkable that that's actually possible. And you can invite, you know, if you're talking to a climate skeptic, you can invite them to uh, explain, well, how, how did that happen? Like, how did you, we get all countries to agree on something like this when they kind of can't agree on anything else? There, there must be something going on there, right? So, of course, they could go to super conspiratorial land. Um, we'll get to that maybe in the next section about plausible explanations. But um, at least that gives them something to think about, right? But then there's more to it than that. So you can talk about some of the methods that are used. Again, instead of just telling someone, oh, you know, scientists know what they're talking about, you don't have to know a lot about the details of, of the science, right? But you can emphasize things like, well, scientists have 
they don't just take any one piece of evidence as definitive. It's about integrating many types of evidence. So they look at historical evidence of temperatures. They look at surface measurements, satellite measurements. They do climate models. And all of these things point in a similar direction in, in, um, as evidence for you know, the reality of man-made warming. Um, and that it's not any single approach or method that's, um, that, that's trusted, but it's actually a very wide range of types of evidence. Um, and again, another point related to that is emphasize that there aren't plausible alternative explanations for recent warming. So climate deniers make all sorts of excuses about, oh, you can't trust the models or some of these data points don't line up with others or, you know, the historical data is uncertain. But what they never really tried to do is actually give an altern a plausible alternative explanation for recent warming trends. Um, it's all sort of obfuscation and... Um, changing the subject and things like that and creating sort of doubt. But you can challenge people directly, sort of, well, what, what, what do you think the best explanation is? Or um, do you, you know, know of experts who are, uh, who, whom you uh, respect who are actually proposing alternative explanations? And, and that's a sort of a harder thing um, always to do and uh, to actually provide an alternative rather than just criticize. And so challenging people to think about that, like, hmm, like what do the experts that I trust actually have to say about the matter? Um, Another thing is to, ch uh, last point here, um, challenge claims of bias. So of course, many people accuse climate scientists of being biased or of ba um, have being um, you know, paid off by, well, I don't know who exactly, but of having a financial interest in the, um, you know, in the uh, science that they conduct. Again, we, we, can, um, we can encourage people to think about that more critically rather than just sort of accepting that as a, a talking point, ask them, um, well, what specific claims are climate scientists making that are incorrect as a result of, you know, the, the bias coming from their funding? And also, why hasn't um, someone who has different biases been able to show that that specific research is wrong? In other words, ask them to try to give some more detail rather than just raising questions or doubts, like who specifically is wrong and who has been able to show that? And this gets back to the point about the scientific method, because the science, if I just pull that up again, um, scientific process is um, an open intellectual endeavor. And so if someone is critiquing science or the results of science, you can ask them, well, where are the studies showing that you know, the mainstream science is incorrect or where are the experts? And why have no um, you know, government um, ag scientific agencies across the world taken them seriously? Um, why haven't um, these results been published in, in the major journals, right? Like we all know scientific journals like sensational findings. If someone actually had convincing evidence that global warming was not man-made, why wouldn't they publish that? Um, so the point is, you know, any one of these arguments is potentially not going to be convincing to a person. I'm not saying that there's a magic bullet here. What I'm emphasizing is when we're talking to, you know, someone who is critical of the science, what, we, what I think we should try to do is in our discussion, not just bombard them with scientific facts or tell them, you know, this is an overwhelming consensus, we should try to encourage them to think about what are the reasons we have for trusting science? And, and those reasons relate to, I would argue, the sort of distinctive um, methodology and approaches of science, of openness and critical viewpoint and self-correction. And then in invite them to um, think about some of their criticisms in the light of those aspects. So science is open. So why isn't it that we see people showing that the mainstream science is wrong in scientific journals um, or in conferences uh, or in, in any other country um, around the world. If there was the evidence, what's stopping people from showing that and um, convincing other people? Um, ask them to show examples of alternative explanations, right? Which again, it, science is open to. Um, and talk about the diversity of the methods used and emphasize that it's not just like scientists make a decision or decide something based on, on the faith, but it's a matter of using many different lines of evidence alongside each other. So these are some of the, um, I think, um, ideas. Oh, and by the way, I'm just, uh, yeah, these are some of the ideas that we can, I think, draw upon philosophy to help us to think about the underlying methodology a bit better rather than talking about science as a product, as a finished thing. Like, here's what scientists think. Talk about the process behind it and the mechanisms that lead to that reliability. Um, and I just um, put a little image here about this. This is actually a book and a documentary, Merchants of Doubt. Um, it talks about how the... Um, oil industry as well as, uh, well, the fossil fuel industry as well as various sort of conservative political interests have um, combined to finance the sort of industry of climate denialism and generation of doubt. So that, that's sort of interesting just from the point of view of um, people, essentially people who are critical of um, science will often accuse scientists of bias and financial incentives. 
And that's sort of true, like scientists are people, they have funding sources, they have bias, but it's it's a sort of a strange double standard whereby the fact that the climate denialists also have bias and funding sources is somehow neglected in that. Um, and instead of evaluating them on, on even terms, it's sort of um, only seen one way. So that's just an interesting source um, to look at for that. Um, okay, so that's the, um, oh yeah, lessons. Um, I think I've sort of said all that. So we'll sort of um, move on to the second um, area or aspect that I wanted to talk about. So the first one was sort of trust in science and um, appeals to authority. Now, the second one that I want to discuss is I've called sort of coherence, explanatory coherence and, and worldviews. Um, so those, there's some overlap with the first era, but I think this is uh, a bit different as well. Now, worldview is a bit of a fuzzy term, but in the way that I'm using it here, it refers to um, a, a set of fundamental, so fairly sort of basic, important beliefs that people have about how the world works, and also things like what matters, and what's important. Um, so worldviews take many different forms. I'll give some examples in a moment. Um, I think that pretty much everyone has a worldview of some form, although many people don't think about it very carefully um, and many people have sort of fairly disorganized and um, uh, scattered sort of sets of thoughts about these things. But I think everyone has some kind of worldview. Um, and again, there's sort of psychological research to um, uh, relates to this, but I won't get into that too much here. One thing that people tend to do when they perceive a contradiction in their worldview or in sort of fundamental important beliefs is that leads to a state called cognitive dissonance where people feel sort of uncomfortable. There's these sort of beliefs that they have intention which seem like a contradiction. And when people realize that, often that leads to belief revision. But it doesn't necessarily lead to belief revision in the way that you would want. Um, so for example, if, if um, someone, just to give an example from last time, someone who's a climate denier finds some new argument or evidence or something that contradicts something that they believed, instead of getting, instead of that leading them to revise their climate denialism perspective, they may well just as be as likely to reject that evidence and say, no, that's not correct or it's biased or something like that. So cognitive dissonance, a, a, a challenge of someone's worldview or a, an element of that worldview typically or can often lead to belief revision, but not always the belief revision that we would want. And that's sort of the challenge. When you present someone with disconfirming information of some sort of fundamental belief, often they'll reject that new information or try to reinterpret it in some way. Um, oh, that's what I've said here. And that's sort of not ideally what you want. What you want to do is provide challenging information or arguments and have that, um, and have the person, at least over time, reform, change their, their fundamental views not just to reject new evidence and arguments. But the challenge is sort of how to do that, um, how to provide challenges um, to their thinking in a way that doesn't lead to sort of those being rejected. Now, I've just given some examples here of the sort of things that I'm talking about when I talk about worldview. I'm not going to be very specific about exactly you know, how to define that. It's not super important here. It includes things like political worldviews. So, you know, like political compass here, um, those form an important part of many people's worldviews. Religious traditions, um, are also important or, or lack thereof. There's also other things that are a bit more amorphous, like um, I put um, a figure here that some people might have seen from the World Value Survey. They ask a series of questions in, in different countries about people's values in life. And um, this is one way to represent some of the um, responses um, and how they sort of systematically vary over countries. Again, the details of that aren't important. I'm just emphasizing that there are many aspects to worldview. Um, and I'm kind of referring to just a broad set of, of beliefs uh, that people have about the world. And um, that importantly, these worldviews shape how people evaluate claims and respond to evidence. And um, as I sort of indicated, worldviews are generally quite resistant to change. Sometimes people can be more amenable to change. Often if there's a crisis in life or something goes badly for them, there's, there's something that challenges them specifically, they may rethink their worldview, but often people aren't very amenable to change. And so um, that means that if you challenge any single existing belief that they have, um, it's very difficult to, to do that because a single belief is embedded in what's sometimes called a web of beliefs, uh, a set of beliefs that are kind of connected together and mutually supporting. Um, and as I've said here, people interpret evidence in the light of their existing beliefs. So we might each be in encounter the same evidence but draw different conclusions from that because of the worldview, the way we interpret that evidence. Also, people are motivated to accept beliefs that are convenient for them. Um, that's something I mentioned at the start, whether that's for sort of social, cultural reasons or whether that's directly self-serving or it makes them feel better. Um, whether people are aware of that motivation or not, that, um, that still uh, often happens. Also, people typically don't try to think about things in different ways. They typically think about something in the way that's most natural for them to think about it. 
congruent with their worldview. And they don't very naturally try to think, well, how would someone else think about this? What's an alternative explanation? Um, what's a different point of view on this issue? Um, these diagrams are just sort of vaguely illustrative of the point that um, we shouldn't think of misinformation or incorrect beliefs as singular facts that people think that they know which are wrong or singular false beliefs. We should think of them as a complex web of beliefs tied up with motivations and identity and things like that, which are therefore going to be very difficult typically to, to change and often cannot be changed simply by challenging one particular thing. You have to kind of tackle the whole, um, the whole web or at least a significant part of it at once. But obviously that's difficult. You can't challenge sort of every belief at the same time, right? Um, so how can we do that? Or what's, um, what's the sort of a way forward? Well, I think that there's some ideas from philosophy that we can sort of appeal to here. I mean, the idea of a worldview and you know belief uh, web are ideas taken from philosophy as well. But um, in terms of how we can how this can help us to respond to misinformation, so one thing that I think we should be very cognizant of is usually there may be exceptions, but usually you don't want to try to challenge a single belief, at least not when it's an important belief or when it's related to an important belief. Um, instead, I think what's typically more helpful is presenting an alternative interpretation. Um, I'll give the example of that in a moment. Um, so what you want to do is provide an alternate way of viewing something. Um, don't say, oh, that thing that you believe is wrong, but say, well, here's another way to look at it, or here's how I might look at that. And when you're doing that, provide your preferred interpretation or the alternative interpretation. Give as much detail and ex provide a sort of explanatory coherence as one can. Um, obviously, you know, there are constraints on that. You won't be able to explain everything, um, and I'm not... I'm not encouraging people to make things up here, but I'm saying there is evidence that people find um, people find explanations more compelling when they're more detailed and have more internal coherence to them. Now, this is why um, this is why, for example, I think that skeptics often go wrong or, or don't do as well as they can when they challenge beliefs about the paranormal, for example, or um, uh, alternative medicine or things like that, um, and engage in debunking. And they'll show, you know, oh, this claim is false and the evidence doesn't support this and so forth. And, and like, that's all fine. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that as such. But the problem is, if you don't offer alternative explanations for the experiences people have, like, oh, what did I see or what did I hear, in, you know, in the, in the woods or what was, um, you know, what happened in this weird experience that someone reported, then often people will just default to believing the best explanation that they have. So you might explain to them why the evidence doesn't support their belief, but if you don't provide them with some, with an alternative explanation, often they'll simply cling to the one that they have. So it can be useful to provide an alternative explanation, even if we're not sure if that's the correct one. It can be an illustrative exercise to show them, well, there are other ways to think about this. Here's an example. And that often makes it more kind of real and makes it easier for people to see, oh yeah, actually there are different alternatives here. Um, and to facilitate that, you can also ask probing questions to highlight tensions within their existing worldview. You can sometimes directly point them out, but often if you do that, then people will get very defensive or they'll try to immediately um, rationalize or justify those. But it can be more useful, and the Socratic method is sort of a version of this, to try to ask people questions to get them to think about it themselves and highlight those tensions. Um, and basically what you're trying to do here by um, providing an alternative explanation and, and, and explaining that in a way that makes it kind of coherent and fit together well, while also asking questions that are, are designed at highlighting tensions within the existing worldview. What you're trying to do is you're trying to weaken the explanatory system that they currently have, the, the kind of relevant aspect of their worldview, while, and strengthening the alternative one that you want to promote. All the while, ideally, you don't ask them to just like switch from one to the other because often that's too big a change. That's too confronting. You're sort of just presenting a different way of thinking and trying to make it more and more attractive and trying to kind of weaken the plausibility of the one that they currently degree, uh, currently believe. And this is a way of potentially, partly, again, I'm not saying this is a magic source solution, but it's a way of trying to get around this issue of just tackling one belief at a time, which if you do, then they'll just... Um, interpret whatever you say in the light of their own worldview. Instead, try to take a more holistic approach, offering an alternative explanation or way of viewing things while weakening the one that they currently hold to. And another tactic that you can use that's related to this is try to show how core values that they have are not really threatened by belief change. So often what people will do is if they feel like changing a belief about something will require them to change or uh, adopt a different belief about something that's really important to them, a core value, maybe that's a religious or a political value or something like that, um, then they'll, they'll 
um, refuse to change their other belief, right? Because the, the core value is more important. And so they'll just reject anything that threatens that. But if you can dissociate them and if you can show them, actually, no, you, you can believe this thing, but still keep your core value, um, then they may feel less threatened and more willing to, um, to accept the new belief. I mean, a sort of a classic example of this is traditionally, many religious people thought that evolution was a challenge to, uh, you know, religious belief, like Christian belief or, or um, Muslim belief, if you can convince them that, no, you can still be a Christian and believe in evolution, then they're much more likely, many people at least are much more likely to accept evolution, um, rather than the alternative is to sort of say, well, no, actually, yeah, if you do accept evolution, then you'll have to abandon uh, Christianity, much harder than to get them to accept evolution. So that's just an example of this sort of thing where you might want to dissociate and show how, no, no, your core value is still safe. Uh, even if you be, if you even if you believe in this other thing, and and the thing is that they might not have put in the effort to work that out themselves. So you might have to help them see that um, to to get around the sort of mental block that they have. Um, so let me give an example of putting some of these things together relating to um, worldviews and explanatory coherence. Again, we'll take the example of climate change. So in the previous example, I focused more on, I guess, like the scientific aspect of climate change, why we should trust what scientists have to say about climate and why we should trust their expertise. Here, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the political side of it, um, just to give a different example, give a different angle on it. Um, so many people, certainly not all, but many people who are kind of climate deniers or, or skeptical about the state of the science um, have a political aspect to this. Essentially, they, they don't want the government to come in and regulate um, industry or regulate the energy market. They don't want lots of new taxes. Uh, they're worried about, you know, socialism or whatever else. Um, and so th there's a political component that motivates this, right? Um, so bearing that in mind, we sort of realize, you know, in a given conversation or interacting with a certain person that we're not going to change their mind about a specific belief about climate change without addressing the fact that there's this big worldview that sits behind their concerns, which relates to, say, a set of political beliefs and ideologies, right? Um, so in order to challenge that, in order to get them to accept, you know, the evidence for um, anthropogenic climate change, what we might have to do or what we could consider doing is presenting an alternate story um, about the relationship between climate change and politics, right? So there's there's many of those available, actually. Pretty much look up any political movement and there's like an environmentalist version of that movement. And so you can kind of take the language that they're using and deploy it in this conversation. Um, that's important, right? Because very often people are only familiar with their own version of their worldview. Um, so, I don't know, if they're a conservative or a libertarian, for example, and they think that that's sort of inconsistent with belief in climate change. Well, if you can present them with, actually, but there are, there are conservatives or there are libertarians who are environmentalists and they believe in climate change, and here's how they see the relationship between climate and politics. They won't necessarily, like the person you're talking to won't necessarily just accept that, but it gives them an alternate framework which doesn't necessarily challenge the underlying core beliefs that they hold, at least not in the same way to the same extent. And that might be then... Uh, that might help them be more amenable um, to adopting the, the belief that you're interested in, which is um, adopting, um, you know, a belief in anthropogenic global warming. Um, so an example would be if the person is concerned that, um, oh, you know, uh, as some people say, uh, people who are worried about climate change just um, want to promote socialism or they want to, you know, destroy technology. They want us to go back to, you know, the... Um, uh, primitive society or something like that, as, as some people say, I, you know, I don't think um, very fairly, but you, you hear these sorts of comments sometimes, you can just argue that no, actually, it doesn't mean that. And in fact, there are many people who are, you know, pro markets, um, who also are concerned about climate change, and you can actually, you can take that further, potentially, you can, you can, uh, and this is sort of potentially a more difficult thing to do, but sometimes this can actually be quite effective, right? You could argue from their own, um, uh, by appealing to their own values, that adopting the belief you're interested in may actually promote those. So a, an example I've given here, again, this is just an example. Um, you could say, well, look, you're concerned about personal liberties and you don't want those to be restricted by the government. But you have to think about it from the point of view that pollution restricts individual liberties because it's an imposition on a person's p a person, their health and their property, right? People have the right to just sort of go about their business and not be imposed upon by other people polluting. So if you think about it from that point of view, your own ideology um, or you can use their own ideology to help present a picture in which it's acceptable for them to, um, you know, believe in the reality of climate change. Um, and, you know, that might be more effective in some circumstances than others. It's just an example. But the point I'm making is that instead of trying to, instead of 
I think what we often naturally do is sort of couple things together and challenge someone's politics alongside, say, their belief in climate change. It can actually be more helpful to try to decouple those, present them with an alternate view or um, viewpoint or vision of the relationship between, say, climate and politics, and then argue um, that, in fact, the things that they ultimately value, like politically wise, are, can be realized within, um, whilst, you know, believing in the, the claim that you're interested in, like, you know, anthropogenic climate change. So that's an example of how uh, we can potentially change the way that we approach some of these conversations um, and, pro and, you know, oppose misinformation, focusing on the worldview behind the objections or the um, concerns that people have, rather than simply telling them that they're wrong or, or trying to focus on particular facts or beliefs, think about it from a more holistic point of view and try to engage with the actual worldview that they have, which is probably the real reason why they disagree uh, or why they're reluctant to accept certain claims. So as I've talked about, you can emphasize tensions within their own worldview, um, ask probing questions to help illustrate those and present alongside that alternative coherent and fleshed out explanations, which they might not initially accept, but at least give them an alternate framework to look at things through. Um, and then also you can emphasize how the core values that they have within their current worldview can actually be preserved with the new view that you're trying to get them to adopt. Um, instead of maybe currently they think that those tied together, you can try to present an alternate framework where those are not tied together, which may allow them to believe uh, in, in the thing in, or, you know, reject the misinformation. And instead, as I've argued, uh, what we want to de-emphasize is focusing on single issues or facts um, when often people are just never going to change their minds about those if it's part of an underlying belief system or worldview that uh, if they feel threatened by those facts. And that's what I've talked about, the, the notion of debunking. I think that this notion of debunking is often not very helpful. And there's some interesting um, empirical literature on this as well, where you take a single claim and try to debunk that claim. People often won't find that very compelling because you're only focused on that specific claim and are not really addressing the underlying worldview and other sets of beliefs that they have, which made that claim plausible in the first place. Um, and also, we also want to de generally de-emphasize our own values. So, you know, Maybe I'm a socialist and I think that the government should be doing way more in um, intervening in industry or whatever. But if I try to inject that in a conversation I'm having with someone to try to convince them um, to accept anthropogenic global warming, that's unlikely to be very helpful if they're like a libertarian or something. So instead, it might be more helpful for them to act for me to actually show how they're in, within their own ideology they could accept my claim instead of trying to tie the two things together, which is just going to make it more difficult for them to accept anything that I'm saying. Now, of course, that's not going to work in every conversation, but it's a tool I think that can be helpful. Um, so let me just conclude here um, with sort of some final thoughts and then we can move to questions and discussion. So um, belief in misinformation isn't just due to a lack of information or a lack of knowledge. That's part of it, but it's only a part of it. And we shouldn't think about responding to misinformation as just providing information or providing facts. Instead, often what we need to do is challenge the worldviews, the underlying set of beliefs that foster uh, belief in misinformation and that can be difficult and it's often not something you can just do you know in one conversation or with providing one link or something one important aspect of this is to promote the acceptance of science uh, i think some tools for this are emphasizing the diversity of the consensus you know all countries around the world um you know that um, accepts anthropogenic climate change you know how can we account for that reliability of the method so not just talking about the scientific method or talking about science as if it's a concluded finished final product but talking about the process behind it talk about the lack of alternative explanations this is true for many cases of misinformation or science denial there's they pick at the science but they don't have any alternate explanation themselves to give emphasizing that can be helpful because uh, as we've shown people often like explanations if you emphasize that that science deniers don't have an explanation then that can be helpful um and lack of disproof from opponents, you can highlight that as well. Um, regarding the worldview and um, uh, the, the second point that I discussed, we can promote rethinking of ideas by showing the tensions within an existing worldview or helping people to see those themselves with probing questions. Um, we can provide alternate coherent explanations um, from different viewpoints, um, which instead of, instead of trying to directly challenge one specific view, just provides a different way of looking at things. Um, and if we try to make those as plausible and coherent as we can, we can make that way of seeing things more attractive compared to the person's current worldview. Um, and finally, we can also emphasize how people can preserve existing values um, that they care about, even after changing their view about something, um, by showing how those things can be decoupled or how we could 
uh, you can look at something in a different way so that, oh, actually you can believe in, you know, evolution and still be a Christian, or you can believe in anthropogenic climate change and still be a libertarian, or, you know, whatever the case is, um, which often people sort of won't see those things um, by themselves. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully uh, people found that interesting. And um, thanks also for the comments and things in the chat. Um, but yeah, happy to take questions now and have a bit of a discussion. 